Welcome. This is the September 18th uh, Yellow Springs Village Council meeting, and uh, we have already been called to order. Um, we were in executive session at 5:30. Um, just ended that, and uh, um, I will say that all council members are present except for Judith Hempling, and we would like to extend our deepest sympathies to her and her family and the passing of her father. And uh, she was is up uh, in Finley taking uh, care of that. Um, Announcements. I know. Should we start at the end of the table? Sure. Yeah. Judy. Yes. Could you put that up there I'm so people can see? Um, I would like to announce this. That no, it's the other. Net. Sorry. <laughs> um, don't put your camera on that yet. <laughs> that was the block party. Oh, sorry, and not that one either. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Jennifer Bierman from Antioch College and Jalen Rowe uh, from, God, no, I'm not sure what her, her nonprofit is okay. called, Community, okay. anyway. Jalen and Jennifer are hosting a, a national symposium on restorative justice at Antioch College next month. Um, there are a list of uh, presenters and trainers from around the country who are co coming to this weekend conference that's uh, starting Friday, October 27th and going through Sunday uh, morning. Restorative justice is something that um, is an old practice. Uh, the goal of restorative justice is to heal whatever harms have been happening. For, it could be a crime or it could just be a person-to-person -person interaction in which someone felt hurt or emotionally, physically injured. A any, a really any kind of situation. It's, it's a, a way of, uh, rather than um, punishment by the state, a way of restoring the community restoring the sense of wholeness that has been broken or severed by whatever action took place. Uh, and so uh, I would encourage anyone interested in attending the uh, symposium to do so, to find out more about it. I think, and if you scroll up there, I think it has the contact information for Jennifer and Jalen, and I'll read that out later, but for Yellow Springs residents, the cost is $65. Mm -hmm. I have requested that any staff person, especially maybe anyone in the YSPD, council member, any commission members, especially like the Human Relations Commission, uh, attend this and that the village pay uh, that $65. There are also some scholarships available. So um, I really do encourage people to go to this event. So you could reach Jennifer at her telephone number, which is 971-8477, or Jalen at 536-1168. Could, could I add? Yes. Um, I, I attended the McKee Group uh, presentation on this, and I thought it was an excellent uh, presentation and an excellent project. And um, I will be attending the Friday night session myself. Um, and any council member that wants to be registered, please let me know. And I'm, uh, you know, either Judy or I will get you registered. I know uh, Mary Ann's raising your hand, Jerry. Yeah. I know you would also right. wanted. Me too. Okay, so I won't be to all of it, but. Okay. I'll go to as much as I can. Okay, and so I will get um, the four of you registered, and I'll check with Judith and see if she's available to attend also. Thank you. And I plan on attending all three days. Okay. I will take care of that. Is that it, Marianne? Yes, thank you. Jerry, any announcements? Nope, nothing. Brian? Uh, I wanted to mention that September 29th, The Little Art is having part two of its homecoming series, and uh, that's going to be featuring Martin Bakari. Uh, and remember, the whole theme around the homecoming series is uh, people that have grown up in Yellow Springs, and they come back and share their success and, and what it meant to grow up in Yellow Springs and how that related to it. So uh, you can get tickets online at littleart.com. And I also, uh, my only other thing was I wanted to highlight 
that at our October 2nd meeting, one of our special reports is about complete streets. And so I would encourage um, citizens who are interested in understanding um, how we want to address walking and biking and rolling and you know ADA accessibility and this active transportation transportation plan that we're going to be starting. Um, that would be a great opportunity. It will be near the beginning of our meeting, and we've allowed 30 minutes for that presentation. Thanks, Brian. And uh, this Thursday at 9 o'clock in the morning, we um, the Yellow Springs Chamber has a chamber chat. Um, it will actually will be serving breakfast. Um, it is with uh, Reikley Insurance, and they will be talking about business insurance and how much you should have as a business owner and what your liabilities and risks are so that you're covered, but you're not covered for things that may never happen. Um, so um, that's uh, that's it. I think we're done with announcement. Any announcements from staff? On actually tomorrow, I was going to say on Tuesday, but that would be tomorrow, September 19th, starting at approximately one o'clock p.m. The village will be flushing the new water line that's located at the Center for Business and Education. So villagers may experience discolored water for two to four hours after the flushing begins. Um, so this could be a village-wide um, issue. So we just want to put everybody on notice. Um, once the line begins to be flushed, we will uh, put a notice on the uh, village's website as well as the Facebook page. And then once the flushing is complete, we will also put up another message so that everybody knows that it is over. So we're hoping that everything runs on schedule. Um, we're starting to put out um, notices in advance, and um, if anybody noticed, we put out a notice last week about possible brown water near the Center for Business and Education as the uh, water line was actually connected and filled, um, but they started it much later than what they anticipated uh, due to inclement weather. So they try to, they try to have a schedule up, at, um, up front so that everybody knows what to expect, but sometimes Mother Nature kind of gets in the way. So. We're planning that tomorrow at 1 o'clock, though, to last for two to four hours. Great. Can, can I make one, one comment on that? I, I live out in that area and uh, had a chance to, to watch the, the guys that are doing the work. And I, that's the best dedicated staff that I've seen in a long time in terms of a contractor trying to get a project for us done. They, they were working from dawn to dusk. And they were on we Labor Day. Labor Day, Sundays, and uh, mm -hmm. you know they are restoring the land and so forth back to what it was. But but they really impressed me in their mm -hmm. dedication to to getting the job done when you know we caused some delays and right. they had some schedule issues. But uh, you know they're doing a fantastic job. I think. Yep, and I talked to Jim Clem about it, and he said that they haven't caused any problems. He's farming; he has the corn there. He said that he hasn't had any issues whatsoever with the construction work. Um, okay, moving on to the consent agenda, we only have one item: the minutes of September fifth. Can I get a motion for approval? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, review of the agenda. Um, anything that we want to add or um, uh, move, relocate on the agenda? I would like to add the uh, defacing of the uh, Whiteman signs okay. to new so business. We'll uh, let's, I would like to actually make that all street signs because it's not just those signs. Okay. I'd like to hear a report from Chief. Um, okay, um, anything else? Petitions and communications, Brian? Yes, we just have a few. So we got uh, two things from uh, Greene County Public Health. Uh, first of all is um, an update that a community health assessment has been done for the county, and that is available on their website if you are interested in those results. We didn't get a lot of details about, um, you know, what the status of community health was, um, but you can go online to read that report. And the other piece was talking about, um, let's see, I want to make sure I get it right, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. 
And uh, this is the awareness month for um, those diseases. And uh, uh, there's a great um, briefing about um, indicators and, and other uh, problems with that. We had the mayor's monthly report, business as usual, and a very nice note from the family of Harold Hamilton thanking the village for um, supporting the services and other activities around that. And if anybody doesn't know or didn't see what happened, um, as the procession was um, coming from the church, um, they passed and they, they crossed uh, Dayton Street going up 68. Um, the two lift trucks, the two, was it lift uh, trucks? Bucket, truck. bucket trucks were raised uh -huh. over Route 68 with a, an American flag uh -huh. hanging down. It was incredibly beautiful and mm -hmm. I've never seen our crews do that before and it was really really well I don't you know luckily we haven't had that situation mm -hmm. um, and I I have a picture of Susan I, I don't know if you can <laughs> probably not, not but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Karen, Karen along with that the family told me to, to thank the village crew because what, what our guys did, they cleaned all of our trucks up and they blocked every intersection from uh, limestone. limestone all the way down to the cemetery. And, and the very last vehicle was the, uh, uh, the township uh, fire truck. And, and Dooney was also a volunteer fireman, which a lot of people had forgotten. But that was the last vehicle. Uh, that the family saw when they pulled into the cemetery, and and they were very emotional about about that. And uh, our guys look great. So, thanks. Um, moving on to public hearings and legislation, we have a lot of ordinances, second readings, and public hearings. I'm just going to, we're just going to do them individually. I just think it's easier to do that. Sometimes we have you explain everything at once, but I think these are simple. Hopefully they're simple and we'll just go through them quickly. Um, so Judy, let's just read all of them in by title only. Um, Denise will speak and then we'll open the public hearing. All right. The first is 27, Ordinance 2017-17. This is repealing Section 1262.08, specific requirements of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1262.08, specific requirements. Can I get a motion, please? Don't move. Second. Second. Okay. Denise? All right. Well, 1262.08 is pretty uh, much the heart of the legislation. It, ident it identifies the setbacks and the uh, requirements for the developer to uh, make a pocket neighborhood. Um, I, I kind of just leave it, if you have any questions about it, because we've reviewed it a couple times. Um, otherwise, council, any questions? Um, and is this a piece where we updated the uh, ADA sidewalks? No. OK, that's coming up. OK, yes. I just want to flag that when we get there, but I don't have any questions. Glad we're doing it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Me too. Can you just, just for the record, so that it's in the record right. of these minutes, could you just briefly what just give do. a summary of pocket um, neighborhoods? Yeah. Well, uh, pocket neighborhood developments will be a conditional use. It'll be a little bit easier way for a developer to um, develop a piece of land. It's for un anything under five acres. Um, it can be uh, uh, a, a lot, and w where a the frontage is off of a private road to access the land. We do have landlocked properties um, that do not meet on the frontage and this will enable people who have large pieces of property to be able to do something with the, that land if they want to. Um, and it's uh, going to increase density um, in, in residential A up to six uh, units per acre. Now in residential A it will only be um, single family detached. In residential B and residential C, it can be um, also two-family or multi-family. Um, and that in residential B, it can be up to eight per acre. And residential C, our most dense, it can be up to 14. 
Great. Thanks a lot, Denise. And these, this is a relatively new concept that's been become popular around the country. Is yes, it was um, a gentleman by the name of Ross Chapin, Ch not C H A P I N. And if you uh, Google that name, he actually has a video walking someone through a uh, one of the pocket neighborhood developments that he's done. Um, I actually gave his name, uh, his information to a resident here who's interested in it and when she called he actually picked up the phone and she was so excited and he talked to her about it and was very interested in hearing what we end up doing with it because he likes to add that to his list nationally. Oh nice, great. Um, so this is second reading in public hearing. I'll open the public hearing for comments or questions. <laughs> it seems a little. Seeing and hearing none, I'll bring it back to council table. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Harsh. Yes. Sims. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. Just move along, Judy. Yep. 2017-18, repealing section 1226.06, design standards of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section 1226.06, design standards. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay, this, this is in the planning code, and this is um, what Brian was just asking about. We did add ADA compliant uh, sidewalks. Um, we just put ADA compliant in front of that language. We striked out the minimum four feet, and we've since found out that it's actually minimum of five feet now, but we left that open. Um, well, just, and just to clarify, that it has minimum to, of five feet if you don't have the turnarounds right. every, yeah. Yeah, so because that's so complicated, we thought right. just ADA compliant. Good. Um, and then also, um, uh, it has been uh, put in the, uh, it's been publicly noticed for Appendix B to go before Planning Commission at their meeting on the 25th. Um, and Nick Budis, um, the Executive Director of Glen Helen Ecology Institute, did um, review that and sent Brian new suggestions which I then received and uh, those will be incorporated into this list and for Planning Commission to review. Thank you. Uh, any comments or questions from Council? I'll open the public hearing. Seeing and hearing no comments. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, McQueen. Yes. Sims. Yes. Helsh. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. Moving on to 2017-19, this is repealing section 1264.02 general requirements of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section 1264.02 general requirements. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Uh, general requirements, uh, I don't have my paperwork in front of me. Is anybody? Oh, yeah. The only one that really needs explanation it's going to be the principal uses for a lot on a lot, but this I don't think is it. No, this is just adding pocket neighborhood development into parking. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you. Okay, so to summarize, it's parking. Yeah, it's just for parking. Yes. So it requires 1.5 spaces per dwelling. Okay. Yeah. Um, any other comments or questions? And that would be instead of two generally. Is that right, Denise? I'm sorry. I mean, normally it would be two. Right. It's a reduced amount, correct. Okay. Um, I'll open the public hearing. Seeing and hearing no comments, I'll bring it back to the table. Judy, please call the roll. Yes. Housh. Yes. Sims. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. And on to 2017-20, repealing section 1284.07 definitions OPQ of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section 1284.07 definitions OPQ. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Denise? Uh, this was adding pocket neighborhood developments as a definition in the... Under OPQ. Uh, under <laughs> might be the P. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Um, I'll open the public hearing, seeing no comments, hearing no comments. I'll bring it back. Judy? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Hosh? Yes. Sims? Yes. Wintrow? Yes. 
and 2017-21, repealing section 1284.05 definitions H, I, J, K of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio and enacting new section 1284.05 definitions H, I, J, K. Can I get a motion please? So, so moved. Second. Okay. And this was adding um, the definition of homeowners association to H, I, J, K. Oh, H, I wondered what that one was. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll open the public hearing. Hearing no comment, I'll bring it back to the table, Judy. Sims. Yes. Tausch. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. And Ordinance 2017-22, repealing Section 1248.02, Schedule of Uses of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1248.02, Schedule of Uses. Can I get a motion, please? So move. Second. Second. And this was adding um, uh, pocket neighborhood developments to residential A, B, and C. Thank you. I'll open the public hearing. Seeing and hearing no comments. Judy, please call the roll. Yes. Housh. Yes. Sims. Yes. Queen. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. And Ordinance 2017-23, repealing Section 1260.04 uses of the codified ordinances at the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1260.04 uses. Can I get a motion? So move. Second. Okay, and this was um, adding pocket neighborhood developments to principal use per lot, and it's also um, uh, giving uh, the Planning Commission to look at uh, pocket neighborhoods uh, collectively without all of the different criteria, which actually um, was uh, not up to what we already have in our code. Um, it, it didn't make sense, so we just decided to eliminate that, uh, the, the, the criteria, and just base it on what the um, what we have been basing things on the the visioning the uh, comprehensive uh, land use plan making our decisions based on that and what the zoning code already suggests for infill okay I'll open the public hearing seeing and hearing no comments I'll bring it back to a uh, vote Judy McQueen yes Housh. yes Sims yes Wintrow yes all right, and here we go with Ordinance 2017-24, repealing Section 1284.03 definitions C through D of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1284.03 definitions C through D. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. And this is adding the definition of common open space to CD. And did we also removed cluster housing we did I'm sorry yeah we did remove cluster housing so as not to confuse people okay. and thank goodness it was the same it was letter uh, it was the same I we know could, that was we nice. could do them both in one ordinance <laughs> my god we could have had another one couldn't we um, I just wanted to say to that um, at the next oh go ahead go ahead and okay have to finish um, I will open the public hearing um, seeing and hearing no comments I'll bring it back Judy would you please call the roll Yes, House. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Sims. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. Can, can I say something? Sure. I would like to thank the Planning Commission, the Council, uh, the Solicitor, and particularly Denise for all of the hard work that has gone into making sure that all of these definitions and changes scattered throughout the code were caught to make sure that the pocket neighborhood development proceeds. That is a lot of work and a lot of detail, and I really appreciate the work that you've put into that. Thank you. This, Thanks, This, this was here. an idea from a citizen, and you know, planning commission bounced it around. And we, any opportunity we had in between everything else we were doing, uh, we worked on it and worked on it and stayed on it. it took about a year, but we mm -hmm. got through it. So. Um, I just wanted to let you know also that Planning Commission is meeting on September 25th and at that meeting we'll be doing um, the final plat, uh, final plan f phase one replat for the CBE uh, Commerce Park and then um, also on the agenda is to uh, review the uh, short-term rentals to replace that with transient guest lodging and there's going to be one more a little pocket neighborhood development that will be on the consent agenda for your next meeting because it's just adding the um, 
because we already did it with residential ABC, it's just adding it to the district uses schedule. That's what's on the horizon. All right. Thank you very All right. much. Thank, Thank you. Denise. Thanks, Great Denise. work. Thank you. Okay, we can relax a little bit now. <laughs> Um, not that that was stressful. Um, it was just fast. Um, next, 2017-25, title only. Title only, okay. This is repealing section 242.01, composition classification of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section 242.01, composition classification. Thank you. And can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Chief, do you want to take this, or would you like me to? Go ahead. Um, this is the, uh, the discussion that we've been having previously. Uh, we had changed the um, administrative code um, to read that instead of a uh, captain and two sergeants, we were going to have three sergeants. Um, however, Chief Carlson um, has done a little research and put some thought into it and he believes, and I support his decision, that um, two sergeants along with two corporals would have um, would allow for better coverage on supervision within the police department as well as allow for more promotional opportunities within the department and um, there and it also costs the same amount as the third sergeant would cost because these corporals would be at an even step between patrol and sergeant and would split that third sergeant um, uh, salary. Uh, therefore, this is the second reading of the request to change that from three sergeants to two sergeants and two corporals within the department. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions from council? Chief, anything you want to add? No, add something else. Okay. This is a second reading, so I'll open the public hearing. Seeing and hearing no comment, I will bring it back. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Sims? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Housh? Yes. Wintrow? Yes. Uh, next we have an emergency reading of Ordinance 2017-26, the Supplemental Appropriations. Um, a little bit of a redo from last meeting um, that Melissa will explain, but Judy, would you please Title only? Read it in. Read by title only. Yes, this is Ordinance 2017-26, 2017 Supplemental Appropriations and Declaring an Emergency, Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Okay, can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Melissa. So this is admittedly my first mistake on a budget ordinance. Um, I want to just draw everybody's attention to, um, there was just one thing that I had to omit from this ordinance that was in the previous ordinance. Um, it was fund number 354, which would have been on the second page of the actual ordinance, which was uh, labeled the CDBG grant fund. There was um, a there was a um, reduction of $26,000 that was on that line that actually never got filed with the county because the money was never going to be receded after the original ordinance happened. So since they never filed it, when I filed the first supplemental appropriation reducing it, they didn't have it on the record because the money was never going to come as a pass through to the village. It was all going to be at the county level. So basically I had to redo the ordinance omitting that $26,000 reduction from that line. So that was the only thing that changed, but it did change the bottom line instead of an overall reduction, um, which was what the original bottom line ordinance read of, let me, well, the original ordinance, it was, let's see, nine, ooh, where was it? It was $9,700. Now it's an actual increase of um, 26, or I'm sorry, 16,205. So basically, um, if you look at the worksheet that ties into everything um, that is contained within the ordinance at the detail level, you'll see where I had the uh, strike through there um, in the purple capital project funds area. So my apologies, but I'm making this right by the county and the council by bringing it back. Thank you for catching that or and taking care of it. Um, any other comments or questions from council? This is a, an emergency uh, final reading. I will open the uh, floor for public comment. 
Seeing and hearing none, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, Housh. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Sims. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. Next, we have a resolution. Uh, Judy, please read that in by title only, and Patty will do the explanation. All right, this is resolution 2017-45, authorizing the village manager to enter into a contract with Bowen National Research for a housing needs assessment. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, as council knows, we um, published a request for proposals for a housing needs assessment. The due date on that was September 11th at 4 p.m. We received three submittals, one each from Community Planning Insights out of Dayton, Ohio, for $33,670, one from Measurement Resources Company from Columbus, Ohio, at the cost of $28,960, and one from Bowen National Research from Pickerington, Ohio, for a cost of $24,900. Um, subsequently, the working group met to review the proposals, and the working group consists of council persons McQueen and Wintrow, uh, Melissa, Denise, myself, as well as Elizabeth Boyd and uh, Kevin McGruder, as our two um, professionals in the field. We paid particular attention to the scope of the project, the community engagement activities, which we thought were very important, and the, the inclusion of all of the different types of housing needs um, in the final assessment report. And after all of that review, uh, we recommend to council that we contract with Bowen National Research to conduct the housing needs assessment um, and help us determine a path forward to addressing the housing needs that we have here in the village. Okay. Any comments or questions from council members? Mary Ann, did you yeah. have anything you wanted to say? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, about a decade ago, Karen and I started <laughs> talking about doing this. We even sent out a feeler to a potential provider, which didn't come to anything. <laughs> but so this is very exciting to me. We're going to be meeting with uh, the provider uh, this week, the end of this week. Mm -hmm. And uh, I anticipate that there will be more information coming out, and I hope that there will be an article in the paper once we get this thing rolling. Uh, and uh, this will have, a, hopefully, a pretty significant community engagement piece as part of it. And our goal is to get it completed by the end of the year. And uh, at, from that, then develop housing policy to help us create more housing units that I think this community needs, both for a diverse uh, population and for affordability. Great. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, it looked like a very uh, detailed proposal, and I wondered if uh, any of you wanted to highlight a few things that stood out about um, this consultant? Well, their breadth of experience, one. They have, uh, they're not a huge company. They're, they're located in Columbus, but they have done housing needs assessment all over the country, it seems like, including uh, with two communities, one I think in Minnesota and one in Colorado that are somewhat comparable to Yellow Springs. Mm -hmm. And they provided us with uh, examples both of uh, what the assessment looks like when it's done as well as um, what proposals might look at, like requests for proposals. Also, we talked, well, we talked with them as we were educating ourselves and they were just very helpful, very friendly. So I guess a combination of the cost, they were the lowest bidder, mm -hmm. the breadth of their experience. Also, Patty, I think you might want to say that the references were... Yes, I uh, checked uh, references on all of the, th the firms and they all had outstanding references, but Bowen, people were particularly um, complimentary about Bowen's community engagement piece, mm -hmm. which was very important to us. Right. Yeah, I mean, everything, from my standpoint, the proposal was great, the references were great, everything, and the fact that they were actually the low bidder, I was mm. really surprised by that. So that just was pretty much icing on the cake, um, because I would have, they would have probably been my choice anyway. Mm. So um, that made, made the decision easy. 
Great. Ready to take a vote? Do you want to see if anyone in the audience? We <laughs> <laughs> don't have a really <coughs> all those robust in favor, audience really, out I there. Know. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 I'm sure have you I, have you done a pan of the audience? I'm sure if Diane has any questions, <laughs> she'll be she'll and be what, when we're losing one of them. Oh, no. Chief, oh, please no. stay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sure if Diane has any questions, she'll be calling tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do we have citizens' concerns? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess we won't. Okay, so. Uh, we have no special reports. Old oh business. Um, tap fee increase discussion. We had um, some information provided by Patty in the packet. And if you want to take start on that. Okay. Um, we had brought the tap fee discussion to council um, uh, about a month ago, I think, perhaps. Um, we've talked about it on and off uh, for the past couple of years. and. Um, it was one of those things that kept getting put on a back burner. We finally got around to it. Staff put our heads together. And the one question that council had when we brought it previously was could they have more information on what went into determining the sewer cap fee? Because um, on water and electric, we actually provide materials plus labor. And on the sewer, we were doing a, an inspection uh, type of thing. So. Um, council asked for a little bit more information on that and you'll find in your packets uh, the additional information on the tap fees as to what goes into it. Um, each sewer tap fee requires three visits from staff. The first one is to locate the main where the tap is to be put in. The next one is to inspect the, the dig while it's open and then to inspect the final uh, and the tap when it's made and then to inspect the final completion when it's covered up. So it takes three staff visits to, to take care of that. Whereas if we're doing electric or water, it's usually just that one visit because we're doing the tap, we do it and get it done. Um, capacity limits at the sewer plant, while normally sufficient, can be exceeded during moderate or heavy rain events because of the excessive inflow and infiltration that we have in, in our system and our, our infrastructure. Um, that allows a lot of rainwater to get into the sanitary system. And so we are initiating a program of sewer relining. You, do, you have seen in the past a line in Jason's budget um, to do that. But that is a long and arduous process. And so some of these increased costs could be put towards that program. Um, also, several years ago, the EPA mandated the storm water from homes and businesses not go into the sanitary sewer system. That, back in the day, which is a familiar term, um, that was how um, storm water was handled. Downspouts were put into sanitary sewers. Um, that's no longer allowed, and we really need to have an active program to help home homeowners who do have uh, runoff um, connected to the sanitary sewer. We need to find a way to help them disconnect that and put it into the appropriate storm sewer. So one thing that staff has talked about in the past is trying to find a way to help small grants to help homeowners make that happen. Um, and so, because if we do a smoke test, you're going to see smoke coming from a lot of people's downspouts. We'll put smoke into the sanitary sewer and you'll see it come out of downspouts because they're connected to the sanitary sewer. Mm -hmm. So that could be, uh, you know, it's not that we do a huge number of taps, although I think Denise told me she's already done five, um, five new home permits this year. So, you know, that's five new taps right there. Um, so it should be noted that these fees will only apply, apply to um, new taps, not affect anyone who has an existing tap that's already done and paid for. So um, that, that would be where the additional funding for the sewer taps would go. And in addition to that, does anyone have any questions about that? One, one quick question, because mm -hmm. we, we ran into that a, a couple of years ago where someone had done a tap and two houses were connected, mm -hmm. which is in violation, so Correct. one had to be disconnected. Right. Now, would that be considered a new tap for the person that... <laughs> it, it, would, it would be a new tap, okay. and whether that tap was split half and half between those two homeowners or what, but yes, that would be a new tap. Okay. 
because technically you're only allowed one. one. Now, but why did that happen in the first place? Because that actually happened at our house, and wouldn't the village have allowed that in the first place? The village would have allowed it, at, well, had to allow it if they inspected it. I mean, I don't, but obviously well, those caps are older. In this so. particular case, we found that when the, uh, they had a plumbing contract to come in and fix the water line, they were refurbishing the house, and on the million to us, they snuffed the Oh, they just did it on their own yeah. kind of thing? Right. Mm -hmm. Found so. that they had no permit at all to do it. So. Do you have any idea how, how much backup on the water? I, I mean, first of all, I mean, our eight or ten inch lines, that's probably not going to really happen the, that much. It doesn't, and that's really only the cost of the meter. Okay. Um, once it gets up to that size, that's, that's materials plus cost, that's the meter plus Johnny's not even charging the labor for that, I don't mm -hmm. believe, so. I just... Can I see a typo? Yeah, I know. Um, I just wouldn't want to disincentivize no, that's development. No, that's strictly the, that's the meter costs. Meters are very expensive. Okay. So, are there any other questions on the sewer tap? Well, I guess I just wonder, based on some of the justifications for the tap fee increase, does that mean that some of those funds are going to go to the capital improvement fund? Yes. We okay. Can, we can put those into the capital improvement if that's where council. That's something that Melissa will bring up during enterprise. Um, during gotcha. the enterprise funds, we've already talked about moving more money into capital improvements. Okay. And then there was, uh, I believe, Karen, you were the one who asked for a little bit more information from some AMP communities on the mm -hmm. electric. And so there are a few. I actually sent out more emails and made more phone calls, but this is what I got back on the electric um, from Jackson Center, Galleon, Shelby, and Arkeem. Okay. And again, on that, that is primarily the cost of, of what we put into it. Okay. That looks good. Um, so um, I guess we'll talk during um, agenda planning when this will come back in the uh, form of legislation. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, moving on to new business, general fund budget. All right, so that's coming to me. <laughs> okay, so what everyone has in their packets um, is, is the general fund budget, um, which is the condensed version and then what I have in front of me is the um, expanded version of the budget and that was a separate attachment note there it was Judy okay so this the general fund budget is fairly straightforward it's only four pages um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna go over kind of what we're looking at, the structure of this, and then I'll, I'll go over everything at a high level and then we can go into as much or as little detail as council wants because everybody seated at the table tonight has been through all of the budgets with me. Um, so this is my fifth, um, which is kind of hard to believe. Mm -hmm. So um, it's definitely been a process for me to try to figure out the best way to present this and I'm always open to suggestions so if anybody would like to see anything tweaked or changed about the presentation of the budget let me know because this same format will be spread across all of the budgets that we will be looking at um, during this whole discussion over the next uh, several meetings. So um, if, we, if we look at this budget, and all of the budgets will be formatted um, in the same way, we will have actuals from 2015 and 2016, so we will have a historical perspective of two years prior. Um, however, the spreadsheet that I work off of um, has figures back to 2010. Um, however, I hide them um, so that the spreadsheet isn't overly um, cumbersome. So if anybody has any questions about anything historically previous to that, um, I do have that information available and I can pull it up on my laptop here too. Um, so we've got some historical information and then in the um, darker blue column to the left, the first colored column, is the 2017 budget. So that's what council had um, originally approved. And then um, that does not include any of the uh, supplemental information because it, since that kind of stuff changes so often, it, it can just become kind of cumbersome. So I just leave it with what was originally approved. And then um, the very next column to the right of that 
are our figures as of the end of August. So I give myself a pretty tight window um, in order to give council the best possible projections. So I, I waited until the end of um, August's business. I reconciled the accounts and then um, I was able to give actual numbers um, as of just two weeks ago. And then what I do is a pretty imperfect science of projecting out based on what has either been brought in or expended to figure out where I think we're going to end 2017 so we can kind of take a look at what was budgeted and then um, where I think we will actually fall. Um, keep in mind, I try to approach everything with a conservative approach. So. I tend to um, estimate our revenues will come in slightly lower um, with the expectation that they will come in a little bit higher, um, pleasantly hopefully. And then with our expenditures, I usually try to estimate those higher with the hope that they will come in um, a little bit lower. So we will have in the purple column our 2017 projections. And then in the um, last colored column will be the 2018 budget. So what I'll do is I'll start out with an overview of the revenues um, and then we can talk about those and then we can go into the expenditures. Is everybody okay with that? So far so good? Okay. So revenues, this is actually something that um, I was pretty excited to, to kind of see come along. Um, our general fund revenues are broken into uh, local taxes in which um, council is able to see every single individual line when it, it, it relates to revenues. It would be entirely too um, cumbersome if I, if I did that with the expenditures, but with the revenues you're able to see every individual line in which our income um, is associated with. So we've got our local taxes, which is the bulk um, of our general fund revenues, which consists of our real estate taxes, personal property taxes, kilowatt hour tax, and then city income tax. Real estate taxes are usually pretty stable. We usually know exactly what we're going to bring in because the county auditor is pretty good at telling us that well in advance, um, which is an exercise that we just went through with the tax budget is basically um, projecting what our real estate taxes are going to look like for the next year. So those rarely change. So we are expecting to see a slight uptick in 2018 with the real estate taxes. Um, the kilowatt hour taxes are normally pretty stable. Um, that's a small tax that is um, tacked onto our electric utility that comes to the general fund, which is mandated by the state. And then we've got our city income taxes, which is kind of our um, the one that you know could kind of go any any which direction depending on um, what our local economy is doing. So fortunately this year, um, our city income taxes, I had estimated that those would be approximately 1.6 million. And as of uh, the end of August, we've brought in one point, a little over 1.3 million. So if that projection continues over the next, uh, over the last quarter of the year, I'm expecting that to, to um, add up to about $1.9 million, a um, little on the high end of that. So that is resulting in approximately a $400,000 increase um, over what was budgeted, which is great news um, for us. And um, I'm expecting that trend to continue into 2018 um, by budgeting $1.9 million. And I know that the, the next question is going to be where did that come from? And I am set up fully with the RITA system to be able to navigate and look at all the reports of like the top 25 um, contributors and things like that. And although I'd like to say, oh, this is a result of one big thing, it really isn't. It's a lot of little things that have kind of happened. Everybody's kind of contributed more across the board. Um, of course, one of the names that's now on the list that has not been in years previous is DMS. Um, it's in the top 25 um, as a withholder. So that's, that's great news. Um, but otherwise, it really is kind of all over the board. So there's not really any one um, business that I can point to to say that the majority of this is coming from. It's kind of, it's kind of spread across the board. But it's important to point out that that is about jobs. That's yes. about employment. That's about wages. So yes. that's about jobs, which is why we are interested in economic development, which is why we're interested in developing the CBE, why we're interested in bringing Cresco and bringing other businesses to town and helping our local businesses grow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Uh, Melissa? Well, you might not know, but um, the real estate taxes look like they're going to go up about 100000 I guess. Would that also be DMS, or would that just be development? Um, I mean, that, I, I think that that's going to be another one of those situations where it's just kind of spread around. Um, there's, there's little bits that are contributing to the overall bottom line with that. And the property taxes are kind of hard sometimes because I know that when the auditor gives us the figures, sometimes the real estate tax line and the rollback homestead line that's down um, in the next section under state shared taxes and permits, sometimes those kind of blur. Um, so I just kind of have to watch that as to how that exactly comes in. But just trying to give, you know, any one firm explanation or contributor behind that would be difficult because that's another one that I feel has been kind of spread out as well. And, and Marianne, one thing that does go into that that a lot of people don't think about is not just the new home starts, which we're, we're having quite a few more new home starts, but also the lot splits because when the lot splits, now you have two developable lots that are both taxed as developable lots. And so we've done quite a few lot splits over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start realizing revenues from that right. as well. I mean, I do think it's a significant number. I mean, it's because the, those taxes have remained pretty steady mm -hmm. over the last few years, and there's a significant increase. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that is good. I, obviously, it's going in a good direction um, for us. And, and, it, and let's hope it's about um, the fact that there are, it's being spread out among more people as opposed to right. increased taxes mm -hmm. right. for and individual households. And I think that's, I think that's what it is because um, we, we are, we've had so many lot splits here just in the last couple of years and that makes a smaller lot that you can build those smaller starter homes on but, but it increases the base taxes because now they're both buildable lots. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. So local taxes is where the bulk of the general fund revenue comes from. Um, the state shared taxes and permits is kind of our wild card um, because everybody's kind of got an eye at the state level as to what's happening and what could trickle down to the local government level. And the local government uh, tangible line, um, that's the one where there's, you know, been some, some talk about where potential decrease could happen. Um, I don't have anything that's firmly concrete. Lots of people can speculate as to what could happen as a result of the state budget, but I try to just take a conservative approach and then if we need to make adjustments, um, once things are more firmed up, then we can do that. But. Um, those, those taxes are relatively small in the grand scheme of things. Um, that's also where our estate taxes used to come in before those went away, which I think was back in 2013 was the last time that we got a payment from that. Um, so state taxes have diminished slightly, but nothing hugely significant, at least in the last two years or three years that we're looking at in front of us. Melissa, when did... If you, if you go back in that historical reference, when did the state really start to cut local government fund? Um, I can take and what a look were, in this what did we used to be getting? About twice as much. No. So most municipalities have lost about, yeah, it was about 2012, yeah. 13. It was about six years ago, five or six um, years. With the local government fund, uh, Let's see, it looks like in um, 2011 we'd gotten 142,000 and then in 2012 it went to 142 and then 2013 down to 95. Wow. Wow. So it, it, it decreased about $50,000 between 2011 and 2013. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. But no thanks to the state. <laughs> Um, the, the next, there's, there's the charges for service, which kind of exists, but it's rather unused. Um, wedding fees and assessment fees, um, which, as you can see, is pretty much inactive and has been since 2015. Um, the, the next larger category is fines, costs, forfeitures, and permit. That's basically um, mayor's court um, is what that is. 
Um, we do receive some small fines and costs from Xenu Municipal, but it's like $25 here and there. It's nothing really to speak of. Um, so most of that is the mayor's court receipts that we receive from them. Um, and that's on the actual fines and costs line where you can actually see the, the larger numbers. Um, that's a direct um, result of the mayor's court. So with, with it being, um, I, I, I really honestly didn't know what to do with the mayor's court in terms of predicting for 2018 because there's going to be so much change that's coming that I just kind of took a conservative approach in terms of what was going to be coming in and then as always I can adjust later. Um, the next section is miscellaneous receipts and reimbursements. These, uh, the, the big driver behind this, um, well actually this year one of the, between the the income taxes and the other big increase that we're seeing in our um, general fund revenues that weren't expected was this property sales. That was the sale of Sutton Farm that you see where there was nothing projected and we brought in um, nearly $205,000. So that happened um, and so that's a, a result of increased revenues this year because that wasn't anticipated necessarily at the beginning of the budget season back in you know late 2016. And then we have our cable franchise fees and then um, rent that we get from some of our uh, cell towers and things like that. Um, other than that, it's, it's um, mostly smaller, smaller things that we get there, but um, still, still a pretty significant amount um, compared to some of the other categories that we have in the general fund revenues. So in 2017, I had budgeted that we were going to bring in just shy of $3 million, and um, at the end of 2017, we're projected to clear $3.6 million. But again, if, if the income taxes continue to come in as they have, that should be an increase of $400,000. And then we had the $200,000 that came in from the Sutton Farm property sale, which, uh, which equals out to be that additional $600,000. So in projecting our 2018 budget, um, I'm expecting that our city income taxes are going to stay relatively comparable to what the 2017 projection is. Um, I don't foresee us having any large property uh, sale chunks coming into that. So um, overall 2018 revenues, I'm projecting that they will be 3424715 Does anybody have any questions about revenues? I have a few. Okay. Um, so first of all, where is where are lodging taxes going to go? Lodging taxes are going to go into our local taxes. Okay. Um, so are we going to add something for that for 2018? Yes, or? I will. Okay. Um, second question is, looking at the our cable franchise fees, mm -hmm. this appears to me to be a significant dip because okay. if this is two thirds. Yeah then that would mean, you know, we're looking at about 30000 this year. Um, and I'm just wondering... They give us quarterly payments, and I think that the third quarter payment might not have been received okay. at that point. Okay, cool. Um, and I guess I just want to keep monitoring that yep. because, you know, at some point we could lose yep. that. Um, and then my third question was... Um, is there a plan if Cresco gets the uh, permit to update the projections? Would we do that? Revenue projections mm -hmm. for income tax and property tax? Mm -hmm. We probably wouldn't realize any property taxes because those are collect the property taxes that we'll receive in 18 are the ones that are collected in 2017. So property taxes we wouldn't see any kind of a change in. Right. Income taxes, depending on when they're operational, that just depends. Um, it would probably be a mid-year thing that I would have to look at because I, I would definitely update projections once they were operational and had a couple of months under their belt um, okay. in order to be able to give an accurate projection um, because there's just kind of, it's kind of an unknown. Mm -hmm. We could potentially get some um, income tax from their contractors if they had contractors yes. on site for an extended yes. period of time. I know it's a little bit more complicated now. Mm -hmm. um, they have to be here longer than they used to, but that would be something. I'm guessing by the fact that they have been working with these contractors on a number of projects that they prob there probably will be a lot of the same personnel on site mm -hmm. um, for the project, so that will be good. 
Cool. So it'll definitely be permit something. fees. I mean, we may be getting some permit yeah, fees and things, but that's not significant enough to no. change the budget for. No. Okay. Any other questions on revenues? Okay, I'm going to do a high-level um, review of expenses, and then we can go into detail as uh, council would like to see fit. So when we look at expenses, basically we have 11 departments, um, and if we look at um, if we look at the different departments that we have, um, I I break all of the departments down into. Um, a few main categories and although council can't see every single individual line like I said I have the expanded version in front of me and I'm just gonna kinda go over what each of these categories kind of contains because those are usually the major questions and so I'll go over that as a refresher um, every single line for the most part has personnel services and those are all of the wages and benefits for that department um, I did take a conservative approach with all the wages and benefits this year and um, I, I um, averaged in about a 4% increase because we have um, what could be considered the cost of living or um, I forget what the new, um, just what were wage the wage adjustment, um, any of the step increases any kind of increases that we might see in terms of health care or um, dental benefits. So I did, um, I did brace for a 4% increase kind of across the board in all departments and all budgets that you'll see, not just general fund. So personal services are all the wages and benefits. The general operating expenses, there's only one line that's contained within that, and that's the travel and training budget for all departments. The next is contractual services, and this is a bigger, um, a bigger kind of category of costs. There's professional services, insurance, utilities, maintenance, um, printing, advertising, and some of the bigger ones that we're going to see um, in this category as a result of a few of the departments would be legal services and then har hardware and software support. So those are all under the contractual services category. And then materials and supplies is just as it sounds. It's all of our office supplies and operating supplies, very straightforward. And then um, the miscellaneous category is usually like refunds and reimbursements. Um, so it's a very small line within all the departments. So out of the 11 departments that we're looking at, um, there were uh, seven departments that either came in lower or the same as 2017. We have a few uh, very static budgets in there, such as um, the, like the library is a very static budget, um, council commissions is a very static budget, mediation um, is usually a static budget. So we had seven, seven departments that were lower or the same. Those included the mayor, auditor, library, cable, council commissions, police department, and mediation. Um, and then we had four departments that were going to see um, an uptick in expenses um, over the 2017 budget, and that was council, administration, rental, and then planning. Um, what contributed to uh, some of those increases, at least for council and admin, were um, bracing for some uh, increase in legal fees based on some of the 2017 expenditures, just trying to be conservative. Um, our rental, rental uh, properties department um, is purely utility increases. And then our planning, the only reason it's seen an increase was because of health insurance costs um, that weren't um, accurately budgeted for. So overall, um, if we look at the bottom line with our expenditures, um, if we, what I do is I have on uh, page three of the budget, there's a dark blue line at the bottom. And these are the general fund expenditures before the transfers. So this is just purely the operational costs of these departments. Um, <coughs> overall, from the 2017 to the 2018 budget, there will be a hundred, almost $122,000 increase, which is only a 5% increase across the board through all those departments on average. Um, and then we also have our uh, transfers out to other funds. 
I think next year when I do the budget, I might include the special revenue funds with the general fund because I have to have the special revenue funds done at the same time because um, the general fund supports a number of uh, departments. <coughs> And, well, not departments, but um, funds that can't support themselves, such as streets, parks, and then um, some of the other funds, such as the green space and some of our capital improvement funds. Um, so I uh, have all of those transfers that are listed on page four, and um, those transfers are all totaled up, um, including the green space fund, the $50,000, which was committed as a result of, I believe, the last council meeting um, with the, the um, agreement made to TLT. And then I have um, the same transfers out to the capital equipment funds in 2018. And then the uh, three departments or funds that are supported by the general fund um, are the streets, parks and then our police pension fund which is um, a separate fund that just funds um, the uh, full-time police officers uh, pensions so if we look at our very bottom line of our budget um, in 2017 i i projected that we would have a thirty one thousand dollar deficit and based on my projections of revenues and expenses um, it looks like as a result of some of our um, upticks in revenues and some of our uh, cost savings in our expenditures we'll see uh, $730,754 being added to our reserves so if you look at the um, the lines just under there, it has our beginning general fund balance for 2017, what our projected end of year difference is, which shows that uh, $730,000 figure that I just quoted as being added to our um, reserves, and then a projected end of year balance um, for 2017 and a beginning of year balance for 2018. And then I also take all of our 2018 projections um, which, if you look at the expenditure side, I have um, approximately 100000 being added to our reserves at the end of 2018 based on our uh, revenues and expenses, which would bring our end of 2018 fund balance to $2,166,903. Uh, and then I've also got our minimum reserve there in green, um, which I like to maintain at least four years of operating expenditures. Four months. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, four, four months of operating expenditures. Wow, four years would be quite a bit. <laughs> um, so I am more than willing to go back, and um, I gave everybody the high-level version of the expenses. So if anybody has any, in, any questions about expenses individually, then we can go through those departments. Yes. Yes, Marianne. Yeah. So, um, looking at 2017 under the council, I assume that, as you said, that the increased expenses for contractual services is primarily legal. Correct. Um, but then I look down to administration, and looking at the difference between the actuals of 2015 to the projected of 2018, that's a 50% increase in. Um, administrative costs, mostly under personnel services. Um, can you s speak to that, especially the increase between last year and the projected increase for this year? Well, and I believe that that was a typo. That was something that I was trying to expand out um, because when I looked at that just a little bit ago, I, I believe that that was a typo in the personnel services of administration and I need to look at that. So I will look at that for the next time around because I, when I was sitting here making notes, um, I did notice that and I, I need to double check that. So I will okay. definitely double check that and I'm, I'm assuming that that was a typo. Be because great. yeah, I wanted I wanted to talk to Patty because I've had so many meetings with all of the departments trying to remember any of the changes that were requested. I do need to go back at, and look at my notes because when I when I was uh, preparing for this evening, I did see that and I I thought I wrote a note to myself that I need to double check that. So I will definitely report back on the next at the next meeting on that because I truly um, believe that that was a typo. You know something. I mean it. It's great to see a budget that is, you know, that we're that we're way in in the black instead of in the red. But to have such such a difference, 
Um, I think you know some of the a couple of the questions that Brian was asking about revenues. Maybe um, maybe you, sh you can think about not being quite as mm -hmm. being being a little bit more optimistic. I mean, mm -hmm. the lodging tax, the lodging tax, the three percent lodging tax that the county gets is public record so you can put into the budget mm -hmm. what the what the county is already getting yes that we will get from our local folks and then you know the the, the three percent that's coming from the smaller places maybe put a little bit in there or not even included mm -hmm. but we should get a little bit of revenue i mean you know that that revenue is going to come mm -hmm. um you know, I don't know. I, I would tend to agree with you on the Cresco situation. I think it's probably a little too early to put um, to put money in the budget for that. But um, I mean, maybe maybe not, don't be as pessimistic. Be a no, little. No, I'd, I'd rather have her be the way she is doing. It. But I, I I understand that. But I think I I always like to talk to citizens from. A, rea a little bit more of a reality. I mean, I don't like to be talking about the fact that we're in the red or concerned that we're going to be in the red we're and then we well, I know, but mm -hmm. it was projected that we were going to be. Well, Sutton Farm was a big part of that right. too. So that was that was at least a third of that. Um, but I would um, like to just make a recommendation for council consideration. Um, since 2017 is going to be um, a better year than expected and we know that there are some commitments that council has made in terms of um, facilities improvement um, as if you look at where we've just started putting money in in 2016 and then 2017 um, I would like for council to possibly consider moving um, my recommendation would be $200,000 to the Facilities Improvement Fund in 2017. So taking some of those reserves and putting them in there because we, we do have the commitment to um, redo the crew quarters out at Sutton Farm and then we know that there are a number of improvements at the library that have been requested um, down the line in the capital plan that are kind of costly expenditures that we don't really have the money in that fund built up for. So that's one thing that I would like to recommend. And there are there is um, some work that needs to be done in the train station. The train station is badly in need of um, some work. So since since we do have painting, since, um, right, we have some more painting to do here. It, yeah, and we will have um, you know the capital budgets will be coming as well, but. I think that it, it should be something for council to consider since we do have you know some extra money this year to kind of think about since we took a conservative approach with um, adding to those capital improvement funds possibly moving more with the supplemental appropriation that would come at the end of the year. So on the crew quarters, we've talked about that for a while, but we have not budgeted for it. Well, it's it's that that plan has kind of evolved, and Patty could probably speak to it more. I know it was kind of a bigger plan, and it's kind of been revised, and we don't really have anything firm quite yet. Well, Johnny met with the um, the architect actually this morning. He went uh, and met with the architect. We have, um, as opposed to replacing an entirely new building where the farmhouse currently sits okay because the farmhouse is going to be potentially the training exercise is october 7th and the rain date is october 21st um so instead of building a completely new building there there is a revised plan to remodel and expand upon the um, attaching to where the current crew quarters are um, fixing the bathrooms, creating the, um, the clean spaces that we needed with um, the laundry room, et cetera, you know, to, for them to decontaminate um, the new training area out there. Um, so it will be lesser, but it allows us to use the current septic system out there. There's a whole problem, there's a whole problem with trying to get a new septic system approved. So what we did was revise the plan and the drawings, and hopefully we will have within, maybe at the next meeting, a firm cost for, for council on that. Because like, as I said, Johnny went this morning to meet with the architect to try to finalize everything and get that moving. So that's kind of where we stand on that. Mm -hmm. And that will be, um, when those plans are final, there will be con construction documents that would put, be put out for bid? 
Um, yes, I believe that was, I believe he asked the architect for those, yes. I mean, it, yeah, I, I don't know how them. else it's going to get yeah, built. Yeah, they have to do them. Okay. They're going to have to do them. And it's be well in excess of, um, it will have to go out for bids, it's yes. well in excess oh, yes. of mm -hmm. the amount, you yes. know. Um. But I, I would just like to say I agree with Melissa that I think it would be a wise move to move that money this year. I, I'm absolutely in support of that. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, under council commissions, uh, I'm guessing that the the projected is probably off. Um, Where's that? Oh. And it very well could be. That was okay. a very difficult one in which to kind of predict because there's been little to right. barely any activity. I mean, we know, well, technically the only commission budget that was approved was Arts and Council, the council or Arts and Culture Commission for 4000 But I guess HRC has kind of moved forward with 8500 without, uh, you know, getting that approved. But um, Have they so had expenditures? Have you it's are, are those nominal? Yeah. So I guess we've got twelve five obligated. Um, so why are those in those? What would contractual services be under council commissions? Let me see um, what's that, been coming out of that. I mean, just because there are a number of lines they may only have um, one or two actually active in there um, which could be printing and advertising and such um, but let and me that would be considered contractual services correct okay because we contract for copyright okay okay and then um, is there, should we talk a little bit about, um, I mean, is cable TV, are we projecting some development there? Or? Basically, I kept cable TV mostly the same. Um, let me look at that in detail. Um, basically, I kept that relatively the same. Um, hardware and software maintenance costs were going to be a little bit less because we did so much work. Mm -hmm. um, last year and then this year, um, I, I, I basically did not tweak their budget very much at all. It actually went down did, did a little you, less than a thousand or a little more than a thousand dollars. Did you add that phase three estimate? I, I did you? not because okay. I was going to put that in capital. capital. Um, okay. I, what I wanted to do with the first round of budgets as we have in the past is just look at operating and not muddy the waters with any kind of capital um, decisions. So I don't have any capital expenditures in any of the first wave of budgets that everybody looks at because I wanted everybody to be able to, to look at what the operations cost on their own. So would that, so when you're talking about the capital items, would that be working on streaming um, council meetings? That's considered a that's capital that, item? That's that last okay. piece, correct? We, the, uh, when Tech Advisors came in, we asked them to look at that. They came up with a price. We divided it into three phases because we couldn't afford to do all of them. But, so but we did one in 16, one in 17. But, but parts one. capital, but parts going to be operational, isn't it? I would assume that there's increased, in, increased or decreased operating costs be because decreased. of it. Yeah. I'm not certain of that. I just it I should just be know decreased what it's because <laughs> if we go with the system that's been proposed. It should just be a click of a button, or at least the same. So, so that might be something to mm -hmm. look at or to talk to Bartley about. But mm -hmm. um, okay, but we'll see that in the next when round. Is capital. that when we're doing capital? Mm -hmm. or, okay. Yep. But I would like to point out that you know the budget is definitely a living document, which is why we have supplemental appropriations. Um, one of the things that council doesn't see because it doesn't have to come before council is anytime our estimated resources, um, which is our revenues, change, I have to file that with the county. So um, if I see, I, I usually file the estimated resources if anything major happens or and we might need access to that money. Otherwise, I usually wait until the end of the year to do it. 
Mm -hmm. um, but just know that all of this is very much living and breathing, and you know, I, I keep an eye on it. Okay. So Very I took good. really good notes from some of the things that were brought up tonight, and I will make sure that I incorporate those into my next presentation when we talk about general. But we won't be seeing this again basically mm -hmm. till the end, right? Uh, this will be part we'll, of it. We'll do. Um, we'll we'll go through and we'll look at all of the budgets first, and then they'll come back with any revisions, okay. and then it will turn into an ordinance after that. Okay. Council, ready to move on, or any more questions for Melissa? I'm ready to move. Yes. Great job. Yeah, Thanks. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, sir, come on up, Diane. Okay. Diane Shittister, Yellow Springs News. Um, I'm looking for a little more context for the revenue increase, Melissa. And mm -hmm. you said you had a 10-year span, I think, of budget numbers. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, what do you see um, in terms of the trend during those 10 years? I assume it's sort of a slow, steady growth. Is there anything more you can say about um, who the income, the major income producers are? Well, over 10 college. years, that's definitely changed in terms of income producers on the income tax side because uh -huh. there's been so much change that's happened in 10 years. I could okay. definitely um, run some reports to give you some more um, detailed information on that. Um, but just looking at this, um, let's see. The income taxes has been what has changed the most. In 2010, just for a baseline, our income taxes were at um, basically one and a quarter million. Mm -hmm. And in 2017, they're panning out to be just short of uh, two million. Mm -hmm. So that's three quarter of a million in the last seven years. Okay. Well, eight okay. years, I guess, if you include 2010 yeah. and 2017. Yeah. So that 10 year span probably doesn't go back far enough um, to the time when we had the bigger companies, Renee and others. <laughs> no. Mm -mm. But I'm suspecting the revenue we have now is higher than what we had then. I don't know if anyone mm. knows. I would, I have, um, okay. I have that, let's see, I think I have to keep, based on um, our <coughs> records retention, 20 years of income tax records. Yeah. So I could go downstairs and pull that box and I could definitely look. And I know that I have before, but yeah, the spreadsheet just goes back to 2010, which definitely dated um, some of those in other industries okay. that were larger before they left. Well, it seems like really good news, this yeah. revenue increase. Yes. And I, is there anything more you could say about, I know you said it spread out over different companies. Mm -hmm. Anything more you could say about how that happened or what the companies you are? You get a top 25, right? uh, Yeah, I do get a top 25, and actually I was yeah. running that report like when I picked up my phone in order to access the Rita website, they have to call me with a code to put in to even access their website. So I was, I was looking at it again as of the latest report, and it really isn't, I mean, the only, the only name that came up, I mean, YSI had a pretty big jump between uh, this year and last year, and I think that that was um, to the tune of, let's see, it might have logged me out, and I, I really don't want to misquote it. Um, yeah, it logged me out. Um, I know that YSI had seen a pretty big jump, and then DMS was on there with a pretty big jump from what it was the year before, um, but I can definitely give you more information tomorrow, Diane. Can, just so, well, I, I would like to get that information too. Yep. Maybe if you could bring that to the next meeting or just share it with council, I would definitely yep. like that information. Mm -hmm. Melissa? Yeah. Do we get much income tax from people who don't work in the village but pay income tax because of the reciprocal arrangement that where they work is a lower tax than ours? Now that's not a real basic report that I could pull. Um, so I could work with Rita to try to figure out how to extrapolate that information. Um, their reports that they have in the system are very basic, and that's a pretty specific um, request that I don't think that there's a canned report for. But I could definitely um, look at that because I know that when we had, um, I think, I forget which which topic we were on, but I had uh, brought up information on 
the different changes if or the different amounts of money that we could uh, oh, realize yeah. as a village if we did change or tweak uh -huh. the reciprocal right. and I know right. that I worked with Rita yeah. to get that information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I would not think um, that we get a ton of that yeah, Marianne, think... because we're lower than most places mm -hmm. and therefore what they're paying in, in the other locations because a lot of them have overlapping taxes so um, they they pay more in those places therefore there's nothing to make up here because we give full reciprocity or full forgiveness right and but like so, beaver creek doesn't have an income tax so anybody in the village that worked in the city of beaver creek mm -hmm. we would get that income tax mm -hmm. but most of them i think beaver creek's the only exception in the the region or is it it, right Pat too. Don't don't we get income tax from Right Pat? Um, because I don't believe Right Pat has an, an income tax. You know, Riverside was trying to trying to get to income tax from Right Pat employees, but Right Pat's yeah, fighting that, them. That wouldn't surprise me that they didn't have one being a government <laughs> institution. That could be a pretty big resource. Yeah. Hmm. When you say we don't get any tax from Right Pat. No, I think we do because I don't yeah, think yeah, they yeah. have an income tax. They, so they we, are not in a municipality, yeah, Riverside. So we, pay, mm -hmm. we pay through Riva. Mm -hmm. Riverside. Yes, yeah. so we should be getting that. Okay. So. Yeah, it's just for people who work, say, in uh, Fairborn, and right. Fairborn has an income tax, and mm -hmm. therefore, since we give full forgiveness, they don't pay us anything if they live here because they pay in Fairborn. Yeah, I, I don't know hardly anybody that's below 1.5. Right. Yeah. That's what we are. So it's. Right. Okay. Um, thank you so much. You did a great job. And Thanks. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank Melissa for all the work she's done on the budget. I know we still have a long way to go, but I know that she spends hours upon hours putting this thing together and meeting with staff, and so I really appreciate the work that she does. Thank you. And you're definitely helping me feel positive going out on <laughs> on a high note so i appreciate that i did that just for you thank you <laughs> thank you i'll take all the credit too um and we just added a we added an item uh that brian wants to address uh defacing of some stop signs and some uh street signs yeah well so i'm coming at this uh with a specific uh issue and um but we can of course discuss other issues but i think Maybe many people know in the village that at least twice in the last month, uh, all the street signs for Whiteman have been painted out. And so I believe, Patty, did we determine, do we keep one full set of new street signs in stock or what? We do. We keep one full set. and uh, So we replace them all. So we replace them all when they were painted with the kind of yellowy gold color. And now they're the new ones are painted with black and these yeah i took these, a picture on my way into and it. these are the new reflective ones that meet the new odot standards that increase our costs <laughs> um so, so okay so the first thing is i thought it was important to make sure that everybody knew that this street is named after general benjamin whiteman he died in the village in 1852 um he uh actually built the first Clifton Mill and uh, did apparently a lot of good things. Uh, he was hung out apparently according to this uh, review with um, Chief Tecumseh, Daniel Boone, Simon Kenton. Um, so anyway, so I, I think he was honored for a lot of good reasons. Um, that being said, I don't see how we can continue to justify replacing signs and I guess I don't see this changing because I think regardless of how much we profess the history or put general in front of it, I don't think that's going to change this behavior. So I guess I'm throwing out there that we should consider renaming the street. Okay, so that's, that's what I wanted to bring up. I'm not saying we have to decide tonight, but um, I'm not convinced uh, that continuing to replace signs is is going to change this behavior. So, well, is that? I mean, I've seen 
signs on the stop, I mean, graffiti on the stop signs too, is this? Well, I mean, this is, this is for a particular reason though. I mean, this is because it spells out yeah, as white, white man. man. And, um, and I understand the times that we're in and uh, it has awkward appearances. And so, you know, I can see why this is happening. I'm not saying that I wanna uh, reward the behavior, but- That is what it's doing though. Well, I would like to hear from Chief. The stop you have to, yeah, come on. The stop signs, the other graffiti, we believe we may know who the perpetrator of those are. The Whiteman signs, I think, is a separate issue, to Brian's point. Um, I did get a call from another retired sheriff's deputy who taught me a way to remove the ink from the signs, leaving the verbiage, but it removes the reflective quality of right. the sign. Right. which is the new ODOT requirement. So I've actually spoken with Jason and asked to hold on replacement of those um, because that, I believe, is late fall. Well, yeah, the, we, yeah we, had to order, we had to order new signs. Um, and, and the graffiti remover will take the, the paint off, but again, it takes the reflective coating off, which means then that the sign doesn't meet, not only does it not meet ODOT standards, but when the light hits it, it does actually, because you can see that the ends are still yeah, coated. So unless odd. you do the whole sign, it's going to be partially reflective and then the center is not going to be reflective and meet standards. So, um, but yes, it does take a while to get those new signs in, so. Well, this is a question for Patty, I guess, or anyone, village government, has anyone have any citizens come to village government requesting that that street be renamed? Not to my knowledge. No one has come to my office, and I don't believe anyone's come to Melissa's office. Judy, no. so the answer is no. But but I have had two young men that that I did not know question me about why would we have a street named Whiteman <laughs> and. Uh, you know, until Brian has done the research, I, I couldn't answer them, but uh, they were kind of uh, just wondering, given a place like Yellow Springs, is how they approached it as saying we could have a street named White Man. <laughs> I mean, I've certainly heard wow. many people make comments about it. I, I, I think it's unfortunate, though. I mean, obviously, the things that are happening related to um, the Confederate flag and Confederate monuments is one thing, but to take some a situation where there isn't any of that going on, I mean, there are a lot of strange names. There are a lot of names that, you know, perhaps you could say them in different ways that could be offensive or could sound differently. I, I mean, this just seems like where where really would it end? Because um, it really is a man that deserved to be honored. It sounds like Jennifer. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this is a really fascinating issue. Sir. Oh. Sure, sorry, Jennifer Berman. Um, I'm here with my restorative justice hat on, I suppose. Um, so what I would propose is um, suggesting to a couple of high school students to turn this into their senior project and to have a conversation with people in the community about what this means, try and get people representing the people, if the actual people who did it don't want to show up, maybe there are people who are friends of theirs who would represent them. And this would be a great case study for restorative justice yeah. of having a circle, a conversation around you know, what people see in that sign. And I think it would be a fabulous project for some high school seniors who need that credit in order to graduate. We might have a history major or a social science, or I don't know if there are majors over there, but you know, someone interested in civics or social science or history or social studies who might want to take this on. Um, I think to replace the sign with another one 
is really just kind of capitulating to a, a kind of knee-jerk um, mindset that yeah. uh, you know I've seen in other places too, and I and as um, Karen was saying, I think we have to be careful to distinguish between actual white supremacy and a sign honoring someone who I think was a pretty honorable person whose name just happened to be Whiteman. So yeah, I like the idea of using it as a teachable moment for the whole community so that, I mean, we can see the different points of view. Every time someone defaces a sign, it costs all of us money, and yet clearly right. there's something behind that defacement. And I would actually even um, wrap into the seniors project cleaning off the sign. Um, and and not replacing it if we're in this moment where it's going to be constantly replaced. But this is a village issue. We're all, in a way, responsible for what's happening here. So I think if if some students took this on, um, you know, and got a bunch of adults involved and try to get to who is doing it and why, um, I think it would be a wonderful thing. And, Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, and thank you. And actually, before this meeting, I did talk to some of our educators and. They mentioned similar ideas, also connecting it to the historical projects that have been done with the, uh, the stumble stones. And actually, there's another project that's going to be done this year as part of the um, <coughs> Into the Wild. The students mm -hmm. are actually doing uh, historic signs along the bike trail in mm -hmm. Greene County. Um, it's going to be funded partially by Greene County and, and some other s people. So the whole historical piece all ties in together. Mm -hmm. I, Jerry, I'd like to ask, would you be able to go back to these young men that approach you <laughs> and now that you know the history and maybe tell them? because maybe they can spread that word in the community that this street was actually named after, as Jennifer said, what seems to be a pretty, pretty honorable guy. Um, and I just wonder if, 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 if I see him again. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought maybe that since they had approached you, that was a way to get the word back. To yeah, um, yeah I, those but I, 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 looking at them, I don't even think they were village residents. Okay. Mm -hmm. Come on. So. Up, Jennifer. Sorry, one more idea. <laughs> so, if we got an art student involved, it would be very cool about, you know, thinking about how they're doing these beautiful signs along the bike path. You know, if they painted a portrait of this person and had it next to the street sign with a little historical description of who this person was. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. So, Brian, do you have your. Are you going to take that up? Are you going to maybe talk to the schools or is I'll take it up. Okay. I'm talking with uh, Kevin Leahy anyway and mm -hmm. I'm the school liaison. Okay. That sounds good. That sounds good. Okay. Um, and and so I guess related to this, I, I do want to know how much it's costing to replace these signs. I will ask Jason how much they are because and we did talk about, I mean, one of the things, Brian, that you suggested was putting Gen, Gen G-E-N on them for West General Whiteman Street. But at a certain point, the sign gets so long that it yeah. becomes like a wind hazard and it you know, becomes that kind of an issue. Um, so Jason was going to check into that, but I will ask him on the, um, the price for the signs. Okay, thank you. Moving on to the manager's report. Um, the, we've gotten a renewal on the dental insurance uh, and the legislation for that renewal will be coming to the October 2nd meeting. We will be having a 2% increase in the, um, the dental, but it was going to be 4%, but then we shortened the renewal period. Our health insurance we renew May 1st, and we wanted to have one open enrollment for all of the, the insurance. Um, so instead of renewing the um, dental insurance in September next year, we will go with renewing it along with the dental insurance in May. So that lessened the increase to 2% for now, and we will be bringing that to um, council at the October 2nd meeting. Uh, the solar array, construction is moving along on that and should be complete by no later than the second week of October. 
Um, I am in touch with AEP to see uh, what they want to do about a ribbon cutting on that. So I will let you know about that. I've got scissors. Um, Karen has mm -hmm. very large scissors. Large, large scissors. And I've got yellow ribbon. And uh, as Jerry mentioned, Majors Enterprises is the company that is doing the um, Dayton Yellow Springs Road infrastructure project, and they are just about done. They are getting the uh, getting them the final regrading done and the seeing and drawing should be done soon. And uh, they have worked very hard to, to get that project complete and move on to another project. So Sutton Farmhouse, as I mentioned, the, the date for the uh, training burn of the uh, Sutton Farmhouse is October 7th with a rain date for the burn being October 21st. What time is that? Um, it's kind of an all-day thing, and I'm sure they'll do interior training in the morning, and then the burn will be later in the day. But I will get some more information from Colin um, about that and have it in the next report um, as far as actual times. The, um, the water plant is ahead of schedule. Um, as Melissa mentioned in the announcements, we're continuing to make strong efforts to communicate with the public in advance as specific events, um, you know, if there's something come up, coming up that may affect water appearance or quality, um, that goes for the unit directional flushing that we're working on as well. And Melissa is going to continue to keep you updated on that. Okay, finally, October 28th, we will be replacing the generator here at the Bryan Center. So the Bryan Center will be shut down on October 28th. It is a weekend day, it is a Saturday, I believe, um, but the electric crew will be in, changing that generator out. The police department will be obviously open and running on uh, backup power uh, and emergency power, but the rest of the Bryan Center will be closed down. There will be no use center that day, there will be no other use of the building that day. So please be aware of that. Uh, a reminder that Rumpke picks up yard waste the last Friday of each month through November if it is in the proper bag. And the proper bags are available down in the utility office. So um, trick or treat is October 31st. Um, we are starting to get that question. And as long as it's my decision, which is for the next two years, it will be October 31st because it's left up to the village manager and I think it's just simpler. <laughs> so, October 31st from 6 to 8. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Chief, is it true that the, uh, the communities in the region have kind of decided on October 31st for trick-or-treat? Yes. Yeah. It, it, was a, it was an idea put forth by the Township Association about 10 years ago to try to get everybody on the same day so that there wasn't this traveling back and forth and kids trick-or-treating like four or five times and and uh, so that's been the the move towards for the last 10 years is to try to to get people to all do it on the same day so that's why I stick to that day well fellow managers yes I mean it, it was really we always did it on the 31st it was other communities that were doing it on other days so it's good now that other people are on board yeah, every, everybody realized what was happening and it just was getting completely out of control so very good uh, Melissa okay um, the only thing that I have to add is just kind of a piggyback on what Patty just said and what um, was in the announcements is that um, we're trying to um, be much more diligent about updating villagers in terms of um, any any changes in the water as the new water plant will be coming online um, over the next couple months. Um, it's going to be a really big task to switch over from the old water plant to the new water plant and there could be possible disruptions um, with water um, for a number of different reasons including the potential for discolored water. Um, so we will be posting notices on our village homepage, which is YSO.com. We will put them on the um, village's official Facebook page. So if we know of an event that's coming up, it's, it's our intention to give residents um, as much notice as possible as we, uh, as we can, and then uh, keeping everybody in the loop if anything ever changes um, based on those plans. Um, we're also developing a communications plan, um, which is going to include a lot of information on our new plant, um, what it's going to be able to deliver, um, 
just some some facts about our water and um, just our water system in general, including our uh, distribution system, which is going to be um, a really important piece moving forward as well. Um, just tips on how to deal with any discolored water if it does happen, what it means for your laundry, what it means for um, you know just regular home use and, and such. Um, if, if residents do have any discolored water, um, we would not advise uh, people to uh, consume it. Um, if anybody has brown water, we are working on a plan to distribute a gallon of water per person during those events. We do have some on hand now. Um, so we will be able to distribute that if we have um, any uh, brown water or discolored water situations within the village. So mm -hmm. if anybody has any questions, they can always uh, contact the manager's office or the utility office and we can help with that. Do you want the hours for the water for tomorrow? Okay, tomorrow we will um, have uh, gallons of water if um, there's an area that is experiencing um, discolored water. So um, that will be 2 to 6 mm -hmm. here. here at the Bryan Center. So if anybody has any questions, uh, just let us know. That's it for me. Thank you, Chief. This will be short. Everything's great. <laughs> uh, really, the only thing that I'm excited about is we're hosting the CIT training for Greene County at Antioch Midwest. It is closed, not open to the public. Um, there will be uh, officers from state, county, uh, Clark County. Um, we're very excited about it. So they've asked me to kind of do an introduction on Monday. And then on Friday, I, I will be one of the role-playing actors, which I'm looking forward to. <laughs> Good luck with that. Mm -hmm. And that's it for the Chief's report. Okay. Great. Um, Thank you. I'd like to back up for a minute. Chief Altman tells me that the burn hours are 9 to 5. Okay. Um, I do want to bring up something. Uh, so uh, the sanctuary cities resolution that we passed, and then we talked about at our last meeting about House Bill 179, and um, you know if something like that passes, the way that they will go after our village. Um, we don't have to talk about it tonight, but um, I would like to understand what the current policy is of the YS uh, Police Department um, in terms of just, I guess both. Uh, given that resolution, but also, you know, specifically, if there is some request uh, for the village to support, you know, these sort of uh, witch hunts or whatever, mm -hmm. what are, how are we going to respond, and how are we preparing for that? It is on the front burner. Um, that's something that we, uh, I am thinking in great detail about. I can tell you now from a start that I will not be in support of the witch hunt philosophy. Um, I think that's why you've entrusted me to this position here in the village. And so I'll do everything in my power to protect uh, people, humanity, and mankind. Okay. And then on a related note, um, and you probably know this already, I know there are some Antioch College students that are concerned because uh, I think it's related, the whole DACA thing. Um, and so, uh, I guess what I want to put out there, and I expect we'll talk about it more, just, you know, that uh, it's great that you're thinking about it and then making sure that we're formalizing um, that policy and practice. Absolutely. And is that something that we might be able to uh, reach out with you as well? Yeah. To assist. Definitely. Okay. Yeah, I think, uh, I think the idea of uh, the village and Antioch College and, you know, maybe other stakeholders meeting to talk about this would be great. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. And Jennifer, maybe you could communicate that. I know the students are concerned. Tom indicated that the students are concerned. Can I ask a related question? Come on up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been, I've been thinking about this DACA thing and other things that we might need to worry about in the future. And I was remembering that when I was a student at Antioch, uh, it was during the Reagan years and the secret wars in, the, in Central America, and we didn't want military recruiters on campus. And we were figuring out how we could do that and be fair. 
and um, Steve Schwerner, the Dean of Students at the time, said that anyone who came onto our campus had to abide by our Civil Liberties Code, which called for absolute non-discrimination of everyone. At the time, the military was fairly discriminatory toward um, GBLTQ. So that made me wonder whether a village can pass a similar ordinance. And the reason I'm thinking about this is that the students were talking about what to do if a hate group gets a license to march through town. So then I thought about this and where Antioch was in the 80s and I was wondering if, and I know Antioch is private, the village is public, but is there some kind of legislation we can pass that would prevent hate groups from being able to march, which might prevent a whole lot of violence. I have a feeling that our solicitor will say no. Yeah, probably not. No, the answer is no, although, I don't know if you saw Sunday's paper, but uh, Ohio University has taken steps to limit the places where protests could be done. So, uh, oh, you had a problem with uh, protests being done inside the students. Um, now, there haven't been any challenges to, the challenges to that, and I don't think the uh, Board of Trustees has approved it, but it's an interesting approach. In their way. But could we do that in public places? I mean, yeah, it's hard it, to it, it, it's, be anything that would pass the yeah. institutional tests. Yeah. But without, unless the village wanted to be on the cutting edge of some legal um, <laughs> uh, boundaries. Mm. Uh, Chris, how, how did we handle that last March, or did that fizzle? I think Chris was here. Yeah. It was in, that was in what, 2000? It was, I don't know, it was down May? It was right, I don't think Chris was our solicitor at the okay. time. Okay, because I was just yeah. wondering, because I, I know. I wasn't even on council at the time. I, I don't remember who was, but they, they did come through town. And my under my I think understanding wrote, wrote more uh, state local and federal authorities and then we're actually marchers and protesters yeah yeah but i do want to underscore jennifer sort of what you emphasized is that you know we've talked about this the last two meetings um also in relation to you know the the stupid signs that were posted around antioch college and and just being proactive and thinking about uh, being prepared in a constructive and and, and and in a way that you know shows what our village values are. So I appreciate your thinking about that, and uh, we are doing right. that as well. And, and in a peaceful way, because there right. is um, there is definitely rhetoric um, happening in social media that is not helpful. I'm sorry, I ignored one of my post-its that I had oh. stuck on my screen, and so I would like to wish. Jerry, a belated birthday, he had a birthday last week, and uh, it was a, I'm sure it was a happy one. And I was also like to uh, give Judith a belated birthday and an apology for missing her birthday in August. It was for some reason not on my calendar. Mm. So uh, we get to, we're at the age where it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> we're not paying attention. I have there for you without your birthday, therefore your birthday is important. Yes. Yep. Um, when she gets to be our age, she'll yeah, really not that now. far behind. <laughs> she'll realize how special not that far behind. Judy, <laughs> I was completely entertained by your report. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> much more entertained than you've been by your work oh. lately. No. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's going just dandy. Getting those little things taken care of. Well, Got to be able to be creative somewhere, not yes, in the minutes. Yes. So why don't you at least? Describe the, the, <laughs> the clerk equivalent so people will know what I'm referencing. Yeah, I think she should read her report. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the past several weeks have been focused on clerk minutia, which I must say is the clerk equivalent of scrubbing the bathroom sink with a toothbrush. Occasionally <laughs> necessary and ultimately satisfying, but kind of a pain to undertake. Pages were corrected for the codified ordinances and duly replaced in those volumes, and annexation, not an easement, and that was actually a major triumph of 
<laughs> of filing. Can I just say that? It was filed and sent out to the necessary state officials. Notices were sent to the paper, board minutes were filed, minutes were completed, webinars were registered for, bills were submitted. This is not the thrill ride portion of the job, but it was productive and there were no stink bugs involved. So. <laughs> Thank you. She sent her stink bugs to yeah. my office. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's move on to board and commission reports. Jerry, you're first. I uh, haven't met yet. Plan. Okay. Uh, Brian. Um, the Arts and Culture Commission, I'll just highlight that um, there is going to be a box at the uh, Veto Award, Village Inspiration Design Award, which is now um, celebrating the enhancements that the House of Ulm has done. So it's in King Yard, and there will be information there about how to nominate uh, future uh, potential Vita winners. And then also, just a reminder that at our next meeting on October 2nd, um, Nancy Mellon will be here to talk about um, uh, housing the YS Arts Council's permanent collection here at the Bryan Center Community Gallery. Um, for the Economic Sustainability Commission, uh, we are super close to uh, having a proposal for the revolving loan fund, so we expect to see that um, after our October meeting at the beginning of October, and I think there's some great potential for that program. And um, then I just wanted to, I guess, mention something about uh, uh, commission spots in general. Uh, it, it occurred to me that maybe in some, in sort of revamping our processes that we haven't clarified how many weeks we should be advertising um, open positions and um, so I thought that uh, we should try to nail that down I don't know if two weeks is a good time or, or whatever but making sure people have time to respond and then I also thought um, that it would be a good idea Judy maybe to add like what are the key issues that a commission is working on so for planning commission, we know that we're you know looking at the comprehensive land use plan. There's some other um, you know big stuff going on, and I think whoever the council liaison is could kind of flag what the the key issues are that may generate more interest and help people wrap their heads around it. And I also want to make sure that when we put something out in the paper that we're posting it on Facebook as well, um, as well as on the website, which I think we do. But just kind of making sure in general that we hit all those different communication channels. Okay. Thanks. Uh, does anyone have any one of Judith's, anything to report on Judith's commissions? Um, I was at two of them. Um, if you would like me to report on energy and library. Go ahead. Um, the Energy Board met and we are going to ask uh, Miranda Leffler from um, Ohio <coughs> Sun to come in at the next meeting to talk about um, some community solar ideas that she has, as well as uh, potentially asking a, a company that helps uh, with energy efficiency programs to come in at one of the subsequent meetings um, to talk about different ways that we can help our residents save on electricity, water, that kind of thing. Uh, different projects that we can undertake. Um, the Library Commission, we did meet and um, we talked about some of the improvement projects that Melissa is talking about. Um, we will be replacing the railings over at the library and the handicap ramps because they're loose. Um, that's the project for this year. And then potentially the next project up for the library will be the renovations of the bathrooms to make them uh, ADA compliant. Great. Um, um, Marianne? Well, um, I believe that the Village Justice System Task Force is getting ready to submit an annual report. Okay. <coughs> can you do your go ahead with oh, your commission? Yes, I can do that too. Yeah. The Village Mediation Program celebrated its 30th anniversary and we had a little celebration. Oh, Judy has a so she's going to put your picture. Judy has a picture. Somewhere unlabeled. Yeah, there were some yeah, great. Yeah, there were some nice pictures. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yay. It was a, it was a, a trip down memory lane for those of us who've been with it for a while. That was that was fun. Um, the school board. I haven't met um, recently with uh, Sean Crichton, but I am now in communication with Don Boyer who is going to be our liaison for the housing needs assessment. 
and I'm meeting this week with Kevin Mighty, is that how you pronounce mm -hmm. his name? Who's the history and government teacher to talk to him about the housing needs assessment. And I will also then bring up the, the idea about using, about the street, uh, the Whiteman Street as a vehicle for discussion. Mm -hmm. The Human Relations Commission did meet and gave a grant for the zombie walk and also for the restorative justice um, symposium. The Environmental Commission is meeting this week and we will be discussing uh, several things including the source water protection plan and also uh, the article that appeared in the paper about Brene and uh, how the uh, Environmental Commission may or may not get involved in that. The Beaver Management Task Force has not met and we've not had any beavers. I was going to say there's we no beavers. No beavers to manage recently. Oh. Oh. Well, <laughs> unfortunately. Apparently there, there are beaver in, um, in along the Dayton waterways, so maybe you guys can <clears throat> Give them some the advice. Dayton waterways. Oh, oh the five that. rivers. Oh, oh, five. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have talked with them in the past. Uh, Green County Regional Planning Commission. I can't remember if I reported this or not, but um, we actually turned down a. Um, and but we're just an advisory board. We're just so it really doesn't mean anything. But we actually turned down. Uh, large annexation, not an annexation request, a large rezoning request in Xenia Township to convert prime agricultural land to residential. And we just said no. And then at the end of this, I mean, and these are these township trustees, the end of the meeting, we were just saying, you know, we've got to do something about this, that we can't just keep allowing this farmland to get gobbled up and just the sprawl that's happening. I mean, Cherry Creek Township is pretty much decimated and um, it's, it's, um, it's getting concerning, I, you know, now even, you know, there people are, are leaving places in, in Beaver Creek and going, building farther out. I mean, it's just sprawling out and, and so it's, it's, um, it's getting ridiculous and I think that I think that as a region, um, they seem, finally the county, these folks seem willing and interested in, in stepping up and talking about it. So that'll be interesting. And it might mean, mean more density. So if more development happens in, in Beaver Creek, that might be better than it happening in the township. Um, Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission, um, we had our first meeting and we, we missed two meetings this summer. Um, not much on the agenda except the, um, and I, there's, a, there's a name for it and I can't remember, but Five Rivers Metro Park is putting together, they have a consultant, Satachi, I think is the name, or Sasaki, he, internationally known consultant that's going to put together a waterways plan for all of the Five Rivers going out, um, I think about four miles from the center, which is going to be absolutely fabulous. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, the chamber, um, I already mentioned that we have a chamber chat this Thursday. Our October chamber chat, the date has been changed to October 26th, and it will actually be a presentation um, from the Village of Yellow Springs Water Department at the um, request or the suggestion of the EPA when we had our meeting, um, they suggested that, that the village do outreach meetings with various civic groups to talk about the changeover to the new plant, what to expect, and one of the groups that they mentioned was to meet with the local Chamber of Commerce. So we're doing that on October 26th here at 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, street fairs coming up on October 14th. Alex Scott would love to have you volunteer. Anybody that would like to volunteer, you can email her at ascott at yschamber.org and you get a lovely t-shirt and a beverage. It might be an adult beverage if you'd like. Um, and then October 21st and 22nd is the Open, Yellow Springs Open Studios, which is a collaboration of the Chamber and Yellow Springs Arts Council. There are 30 artists and 22 studios this year. So 
Karen, before we go on to the future agenda, I forgot I was to going to mention, oh. yes. Um, so I assume you ladies are here for a reason? We are. Okay. We thank you for, my name is Jalen Rowe, and I'm um, with Community Empowerment Organization in partnership with Antioch College for the restorative justice um, symposium that we're going to be hold, that will be held October 27th through the 29th and I just want to um, we have done be, but before I do that um, I just like to diverse just a moment and Marianne I know uh, to the Whiteman Street sign and that is that in the event that the project doesn't come together as far as a uh, a learning situation, I would um, ask that it be considered if the people do come forward and the chief has met with the mediation group that it be something that the mediation group would would um, be a part of or work with. Also, um, both the Community Empowerment Organization and 365, we have facilitated uh, facilitators to do courageous conversations around race so um, that maybe we can just open it up that way if it does not go through uh, a wonderful school project and now my other hat back on restorative justice hat back on I just wanted to say that we will be we have met with several of the local nonprofit organizations and have done presentations and I've been getting a lot of um, calls and emails in regards to when it will be opened up so people can start to register to actually um, uh, attend the uh, symposium and we will be opening up to the public to register it has gone out to uh, certain organizations and certain groups that we present it to but we'll be opening it up and it will be in the Yellow Springs newspaper as well as on all the Facebook uh, sites for the community um, to be able to go on. It will be a live link that you can go on and actually register for that. And we also wanted to say that in the event that someone does not have the means to actually uh, purchase or to you know be a part of the, the uh, to go online and, and get their tickets, that we do have a scholarship fund for those that are that would love to come to the symposium and maybe just not um, would, might not be able to afford it, so they can either email um, Jennifer or myself at, um, should I just say the email address? <laughs> they, it is on the form, we, we, we will post it, but it will be, you can email CEO nonprofit 0 at gmail.com, that's CEO nonprofit at 0 zero zero at gmail.com or and that would be that would reach me or Jennifer at Antioch and I'll let Jennifer just say your email very quickly. It's J Berman, J B E R M A N at Antioch College dot edu. Because we want to open it up so everyone who wants to attend can attend. And I just must say and I and I just must thank all of the community that has really opened up to learning more about restorative justice um, from our police chief to our superintendent and just so many people that um, have just kind of put on a thinking hat that this might be something that we could really utilize collectively in our village to um, solve, solve some things and to really kind of uh, figure out ways to look at harms and how they've been done and have a really a uh, wonderful resource in order to do that. So that is all I have, and thank you very much for the time. Jalen, quick question. Yes. Um, are you accepting donations for that scholarship fund? Why, thank you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, I ex we are most definitely, and if, let me put my glasses on here. If, um, if you go on to, here it is, I'm sorry. It's, it's www.eventbrite.com and you put in Restorative Justice Symposium, Yellow Springs, Ohio. It will come up and there will be a 
page that you can actually register on and also give donations. And they are for different aspects, but we are definitely uh, would appreciate anyone that would be donating for the scholarship fund so um, people that want to attend can attend. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, on Friday, October 27th, before the generator comes in, <laughs> we will be here at the Bryan Center and it starts at 6 p.m. And that is going to be a collective day with all of our speakers that will be traveling to Yellow Springs and they will give a prelude to what the training is going to be on, um, on Saturday. Then Saturday we move over to Antioch College campus and we do a breakout session, uh, uh, sessions that starts at 8 a.m. in the morning and um, we do a breakout session, it ends at 5 and then at the Coretta Scott King um, Center, we will be hosting a reception for all that participated in the the symposium, and that starts at six and goes until. And then Sunday we close at the Antioch Wellness Center, and we will be doing a um, we bring everybody together. We're looking at um, how to how to move forward from this point on in all the different areas that we will be. Uh, looking at restorative justice in and then we will offer um, a restorative yoga session to calm down and move forward and let's take it at, take it to the next level. And what are the hours on that? On Sunday. Sunday. On Sunday it starts at 8 a.m. and it ends at 12 p.m. Were you asking about the yoga? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, if I could just add, I don't know, I keep jumping up here with ideas about this Whiteman sign thing, <laughs> but um, I'm going to suggest to, uh, to one of the facilitators, one of the trainers who's coming in to do work on community and race relations and how the village can incorporate restorative justice, I'll tell her what's happened. Mm -hmm. And it could be that we could do, you know, one of the workshops on exactly that issue. And if, uh, Marianne, when you talk to the high school people, please mm -hmm. tell them that this could be part of the symposium. So there might be some students who would be interested sure. in attending that. Yeah. Um, also, uh, she's also a speaker at the symposium. Do, do you all have something on Facebook or something that we can be sending yes. out? Yes. Um, so far, it's just on the bulletin page and on my personal oh. page, but we'll oh. get it in other. I do have an email. But yes. if I had something that just had all the information about and we're this. And we'll be posting that, we will be posting that this week okay. on Facebook. And just one, one more bit of news about restorative justice taking over the village. Um, uh, on November 3rd, uh, the school district is going to do an all-day in-service teacher training on restorative justice using that as kind of the uh, the tool kit or the tool belt or whatever we say um, for dealing with issues around race and diversity in the schools. So we're sort of getting a twofer. There's we're going to have intensive discussions about race and diversity and inclusion, using restorative justice mechanisms to talk about those things. So that's all day on November third. None of us are invited, but it's going to be really cool. Mm -hmm. And Jasmine Story, who's going to be at our symposium, is going to be facilitating that one with a coworker of hers, and she is really excellent. Um, we had a Skype conversation with uh, Superintendent Basora, John Gudgel, Tim Cryer, the principal um, of the high school and middle school, and they were all very enthusiastic about Jasmine and her partner coming in. That's great. Is it possible to just attend some of the session? Because I'm just not going to be able to attend all of it. Yes. In fact, we decided that for people who just want to go hear the speakers on Friday night, just 20 bucks, and they can come to that. If they don't have that, fine, just come. That was one of the reasons we chose the Bryan Center, that it's larger. And um, it can absorb something like 200. 20 or more people, Are I forgot, but it's big. Them? Yes. Okay. And we reserved because it. I, I, I'm welcoming. 
think, at right. some point. Um, so. Great. All right. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Could I suggest that you actually put your hours on here? Because that's a question I get asked frequently. I think they're doing yes. a new one. You're doing a new flyer. Yes, we are. Flyer. Yeah. Um, uh, in regards to the November 2nd, when um, we're doing the restorative justice coming in with the um, superintendent and the schools, that was actually brought to our attention by um, the young people of color who wanted to see something like that happen. So um, we're just very excited with everyone that is just looking at different ways on how this can be utilized within our community. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, so looking ahead at agenda planning, um, October 2nd, um, we'll have the enterprise uh, and special revenue funds and capital budgets. Uh, Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission uh, will be here to um, do a presentation on complete streets. We're looking forward to that. That will really be the focus of that meeting. We're giving them a half an hour and it, I hope we allow, if, if, if there's a good discussion, it to go over a little bit. Um, I know representatives from the um, Active Transportation Group will be here also. Um, and Mary Ann, you Justice System Task Force will be ready at the October 2nd meeting? Um, I assume. I, That's I what, been yeah, Judith okay. uh, requested that. Okay. Yeah, and I, I've been in touch with Pat Dewey. She's, she's on board. Okay. Um, as Brian said, the Arts Council will talk about uh, bringing their permanent collection back to the Brian Center. Um, we have three pieces of legislation, dental insurance, tap fees, and smoking ban. Um, I would, I would, you know, the smoking ban thing I think is something that will um, impact a lot of citizens and so I encourage people to be paying attention and, and uh, not be surprised um, that this is coming and it's not anticipated to be a complete ban. Uh, my understanding is that staff will have a plan that will have some area designated in all village property parks. But I just want citizens to know this because I know that there probably will be some surprise. Um, so, I would agree with that. Yes. Um, I want to make sure we get those uh, updating our nominating petitions on the. Oh. I don't want us to. Okay. Run, um, run out of let's put it on the 16th. That looks like a um, budget workshop. Um, so, on the 16th, we'll be hearing the collective budget quarterly financial review and revolving loan fund presentation from the ESC, so let's add, what do, what do they call it, nominating petitions? Mm -hmm. Petition updates. And what needs to happen with that? What is that process? Uh, Judy? Well, there are one of two ways you can go. One is simply to, which has been done, uh, that I've I've been in contact with the solicitor and we've just reworked the petition so that it's A, legible, fully legible, and B, just complies with correct dates or gives flexibility to dates that change on a yearly basis. And the other one is to go just roll it over to the Ohio Revised Code process and take it off of being an individualized Yellow Springs form. I guess my question, I mean that that's a, a good, but is it going to require, so we'll have a discussion and then we'll have a piece of legislation, is it going to require legislation? I don't think it does. There's nothing in the charter that states you will use a Yellow Springs form for the nominating petition. It's just traditionally been that we've supplied them with one. So. And this is just for council, correct? Or is this for, for council this would and apply mayor? mayor. As well. Council and mayor, but it's obviously not school board, not township Correct. trustee. No. Okay. So, I mean, if even if we do have to have um, legislation, we still have time if we're getting to it October 16th. So, mm -hmm. we'll have the discussion. Um, then November 6th. At this point, all we have the 2018 budget. Um, First reading, and then November 20th, first reading of the 2018 budget ordinance as an emergency. So, I'm curious, Melissa, do you really think we need, I mean, because it looks like no. October 16th, we've got the collective budget with revisions. Yeah, we could, we could actually push that up. So, we can do the first reading on November 6th. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know why, I, 
that's what we did the last time. Yeah, well, the last few times, and I'm not sure. Why. So we don't need to do it as an emergency. We'll take off as an emergency. And although, do we need to well, because of it, the timing? Yeah, we'll have. Well, if we do it November sixth, then it would go into effect December twentieth because you have to read it. If you read well, it. if we do it November, yeah, November sixth, yeah, it would. It would still. It wouldn't have to be in as an as an emergency. Okay, so we would we'll still say, have enough time. No, you'd be in full. Oh yeah, you're right. But if we did it as an emergency, I could get it back from. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't be implemented until the first anyway. It doesn't have to be an emergency. That's right, fine. That is the one thing is any financial ordinance is it states in our charter can yes. always be passed as an emergency. I, I think it's a safer option. You could get a blizzard. I mean, <laughs> just just anything. It's safer to okay. pass it as an emergency and read it twice. We can okay, show. okay. Um, and then I would hope so. Then at this point, we don't have anything on the agenda for December fourth. I assume. Uh, actually, you do. What's that? We have the H and A report from Bowen. I well, I wasn't sure I was going to mention that, um, and well, we uh, yeah, that's when it's supposed to be done, and that's what they have in their proposal. So I'd like to put it on there. Okay. Uh, oh, I definitely. Think, otherwise, we're not going to right keep it in our heads. So you see that there isn't a December. I don't know what the date is. Sep there's not a December 18th meeting. We hope we won't need to have it. Um, so. Anything else? Anything else anybody's aware of that needs to go on the agenda? I am hoping that we can have a presentation by Bowen just in case. As sort of a kickoff at a council meeting. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's the December fourth. Oh, no, I'm that's a, sorry. That's a kickoff. Kick right. I'm sorry. I've, so, so then that would be potentially well, October second. Well, yes, or the sixteenth, I guess. We already have. I mean, I think we need to wait until we talk to. Yeah, our Friday unless meeting. unless somebody else is willing. Yeah, we've got too many presentations, so it would have to be the 16th. Yeah, I, they may be well into their work. That's okay, though. That's okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. aye.